You know, the holiday season is creeping up on us pretty, pretty fast. And uh, just in case you didn't understand, uh, inviting everybody to the community Christmas dinner, it's an opportunity for us to say thanks to the businesses in the area, as well as to your friends and coworkers. It's an opportunity to come in and just say thanks. It's a low key opportunity for us to present the gospel in a very, very short and brief fashion, unthreatening. And so if you wanna invite someone, get the blue card. This is an invitation here. And if you get the red card, the red card tells all the different events you can come to and invite your friends to. You do need a ticket, as Stu mentioned. Uh, the tickets are free. It just gives us an idea to, to know how many uh, to prepare for as we uh, do this. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together to study your word. May each of us draw close to you. And Father, in the process, you draw close to us. Conform us to your image, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in the midst of a, a series of sermons dealing with the commands of the Lord. And today we're going to look at three commands that come together. Uh, it's wait, watch, and pray. It comes out of Matthew 26, verses 38 through 46. And let's read this together in respect for God's word. Let's stand. And together. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise! Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The Lord had his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. You know, when we follow these commands of Jesus, we're following a set of rules. I, I guess y'all know the rule of life for toddlers. Do you know what those rules are? It, it, it goes something like this. If I like it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I had it a little while ago, it's mine. If it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. If I am doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. If it looks like mine, it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. If you are playing with something and you put it down, automatically it becomes mine. If it's broken, it's yours. <laughs> it's amazing how self rules and how the center of everything is me. We do it my way. Adults are really no different. Frank Sinatra put it this way. He said, and now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear, I'll state my case of which I am certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway. But more, much more than that, I did it my way. 
Burger King simplifies it. Have it your way. Everybody wants it my way. Humanity focuses on my way, doing it my way. But that's completely contrary to the way that Jesus lived. Jesus came to life to live in the flesh. And in so doing, he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. He came into the garden, the garden of Gethsemane, the night before he was crucified. And in the flesh, it was difficult, you know, to struggle with the fact that he is going to suffer such physical anguish. And he came before the Father and says, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my way, not my will, but your way. That was his attitude in life. That's the attitude we have to have as well. The greatest decision that we can make in life is not my way, but your way. Not my will, but your will, Father. Jesus has given us his will. And as he, as he battled spiritually on that last night on earth before he was crucified, he gave us an example. He gave commands to his disciples, things that are just as pre uh, prevalent and relevant for our day as any. He says, wait, watch, and pray. And these things apply to our life today in our commands. This is what he desires of us. And this is what we need to do. Wait, watch, and pray. What does it mean to wait? There are two actual words that are used in, in the context. He tells them to sit, and he tells them to wait. The idea is, in the psalmist's words, be still and know that I am God. G. Campbell Morgan, a preacher of the last century, put it this way. Waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first, activity under command. Secondly, readiness for any new command that may come. And third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. Scripture gives us many examples of, of people waiting on the Lord. Do you remember Abraham and, and his wife as they, as they waited? You know, they had Hagar, and Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. But you know, it was another 14 years before he received the promise until Isaac came. There was a period of waiting. How about Joseph? 13 years he was in captivity. 13 years. And then he was elevated, and it was still another eight years before he saw his family again. 21 years of waiting. We need to understand the principle of waiting, because waiting, in essence, shows that we can trust God's promise. And, and the one thing that we can understand about God's promise is this. God's promise may not come in our timing, but it's always good when it comes. And, and it's always complete. It's worth the wait. You know what happens when we wait on God? Isaiah 40, 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? I read one commentator that, that talked about the type of strength you get when you wait upon the Lord. 
It, first, there's inward strength. Inward strength is what comes from in here. It's Ephesians 16, uh, 610 verse that says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It, it's the inward strength to be able to accomplish any and everything that God would have us to do. And, and then there's upward strength. Uh, upward strength is to mount up with wings as eagles. I'm reminded of Lucy in the Peanuts cartoon. Anybody remember them? Lucy was having a bad day and Charlie Brown was there trying to cheer her up. And, and he gave her a couple of platitudes. He says, into every life a little rain must fall. And that surely didn't help Lucy. And, and then he, he, he says, just remember, life has its mountains and its valleys. And Lucy looked at him and said this. You said there's ups and downs. But all I want is ups, ups, and ups. You know, <laughs> when we wait upon God, you know what happens? That's what we have. The upward strength to keep going. Then there's the outward strength. The outward strength is to run and not be weary. It's, it's the concept of keeping going and, and continuing in the work. It's Galatians 6, 9, and 10. It says, do not be weary in well-doing. And, and, and we have a tendency to get weary in well-doing. But it's the outward strength to keep going. Then there's the onward strength, to walk and not faint. I read the story of a pastor by the name of John Claypool. He was the pastor of Crescent Hills Baptist Church in the late 60s. His seven-year-old daughter was dying of leukemia. And shortly before her death, he was preaching on Isaiah 40, 31. And he said this to his congregation. He says, I want you to know that I, today I am not soaring like an eagle. I'm not running like a footman. I am barely walking through this experience. And I'm just asking God to give me strength not to faint. When you wait upon God, he gives you the strength to keep going even in the face of great adversity. Why does God want us to wait? You know, there, there's a lot of things we can learn as a result of waiting on God, sitting and waiting. We can, we can learn from God courage. He teaches us courage. Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Courage comes from waiting on God. Also, by waiting, we learn to have hope and faith. Psalm 130, verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word do I hope. We learn the faithfulness of God. I'm reminded of the story of a, of a young gal who was, a number of years ago, was dropped in, off in the park by her dad and said, I'll be back at 6 o'clock. And there was a Christian businessman that looked out and saw this girl, and she kept playing, and he became concerned for her, so he walked out, talked with her, and she says, there's no concern. My dad said he'd be back for me. Well, he, he watched her for several hours, and it got close to six, and there was no dad. So he went out and asked her, says, is there something I can do? And she says, no, my dad said he's coming back for me. Then he got 630. And the, the businessman was really concerned for this girl. And he went and talked with her again and said, is there anything I can do? And she said, my dad said he would be back for me. And about that time, dad did come up. He'd had a flat and had to take care of it. And so he's running a little bit late. Her confidence was in her father who had promised to come get her. And that's what we need to do by... By waiting, we, we learn to trust in God and, and hope in Him. It also builds expectation in us, a heightened sin of expectation. Philippians 3.20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also we eagerly await the Savior. Savior. Waiting builds that anticipation. And, and those are things that we can learn. 
Jesus told the disciples, wait. What did they do? They went to sleep. They slept. They weren't getting what they could from God. Rather than sit and wait, they laid and slept. There was no anticipation in looking. It was just self-centered because they were tired and well-fed and probably had a few glasses of wine too. And as a result, they satisfied themselves instead of sitting in anticipation and waiting upon God. But he also told them, not only wait, but to watch. Watch. Uh, the word for watch, and I'm going to throw a little Greek at you, I'm sorry. But by the time we get through with this series, you'll understand it. This is a present imperative. The present means you don't do it just one, you do it repeatedly, constantly. And by, by doing it, it develops the concept of vigilance. Be vigilant. He wanted them to watch what was going on. And you understand that he was in the midst of a tremendous spiritual battle. Watch. There's all sorts of examples and commands of watching in Scripture in the Old Testament. Especially in passages like Ezekiel 33. It talks about the watchman, the watchman on the wall. Their purpose was to stand there and guard against the coming on of the enemy and to warn them when the enemy was coming. And if they did not do this in the military, they would execute them in this day on the spot. Kill them. Because they weren't keeping watch. Even in more modern times, Lewis and Clark, you remember those guys? You know, exploring the the Missouri and going all the way to the West Coast. It, it records how they caught a person sleeping on their watch. They flailed him. They beat him. And then they court-martialed him. But because keeping watch is important because it warns against the incoming enemy. And, and so it's important for us to understand that what Jesus was calling them to be is watchmen. Keep an eye out. The New Testament gives all sorts of examples of, of watching. Uh, I like Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. He says, so then, let us not be like others who sleep, but let's be alert and self-control. And, and in context, that's talking about the second coming. And we're to be vigilant, waiting. Peter warned about Satan as an enemy in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant. That word vigilant is the same root word that Jesus uses here. To be watchful. For your adversary, the devil, walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. To be watchful, to be vigilant in all things. You know what happens when you watch? The enemy doesn't catch us by surprise. There are no spiritual pearl harbors. It doesn't happen because you're on guard against it. Not only that, the Lord doesn't find us sleeping. And in regard to his second coming, he warns that in latter times, people will sleep, no longer be vigilant. We also learn from the example of the Lord. You know what the Lord was doing, what his purpose was in telling him to watch? Here was a climactic experience in the life of the Lord. The disciples themselves were going to face execution. You know what they could learn? How to live and how to die 
the way the Lord himself did. Watch me. Watch what I'm doing. And, and when your turn comes, guess what? Act the same way. Live the same manner. Because they were going to experience the exact same thing. But what did the disciples do? They slept. Three times the Lord tells them. Two times he woke them up. And the first time he woke them up and says, watch. He caught them asleep. And they go, ah, yeah. And they go right back. Why? They were tired. Luke even says they were sorrowful, meaning it was stressful, it's been stressful. Hey, listen, it, it's early in the morning, late at night, whichever term you want to use. Yeah, they'd had plenty of food. Yeah, they were stressed out. They're probably in the cool temperatures in Gethsemane. Natural. But they couldn't keep watch. Not even for this short, brief time. He says, for an hour. Here was the most, one of the most important moments in the history of all creation. And what were they doing? Sleeping. But we're better than them, aren't we? Yeah, we don't sleep. We pray, just like Jesus said. Pray. You know, the word pray, throw a little more Greek at you, sorry, but it's important, is a present imperative in the middle tense. You say, that makes absolutely no sense to me. Present, you got the present down, which means it's not a one-time thing, it's a continual doing. Imperative means it's a command. It's not an option. We have to do it. The middle. The middle says you do it yourself. You yourself pray. This is emphatic. It's not depend on the prayers of others. It's you are responsible to Pray and keep on praying. That's what he's saying. It's not a one-time event. It's intentionality in our prayer life. Our prayer lives need to be one of the most important things that we do. More important than work. More important than food. More important than sleep. That's what prayer is all about. You look in Scripture, the examples that we have of prayer, and and there are so many examples throughout all the different passages in Scripture. You know, you look at James 5.16. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. Maybe you don't have much because you don't pray much. Maybe there's not passion in your life because you don't pray much. You look at the examples of Jesus in all the different things that he did. He was consistently in prayer. After a hard day of ministry, he prayed. He rose up early in the morning and prayed. When little children came to him, he prayed over them. Prayer was an essential part of his life and ministry here on earth. Before he called the twelve, He spent all night in prayer. We have that before us. The examples and the consummate example of our Lord himself. It becomes our responsibility, therefore, to pray. The problem that we have, and I said this last week, is that many of us don't pray until the bullets start flying. In the military, we call it foxhole Christianity. 
Suddenly you start praying when things get messy. When the problems come and we're in dire straits, then we pray. Well, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray in dire straits. you understand that? I, I think we should. But that's not the only time. Too many Christians only pray when they're desperate. And we need to develop a desperate mentality when it comes to prayer. Our lives need to be a desperation of calling out to God. We are helpless and hopeless apart from the power of the Spirit. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do absolutely, positively nada. Nothing. Therefore, we better be praying because we are hopeless. We are helpless. And prayer needs to characterize, characterize our life. Why should we pray? You've heard me say it for many different, many different times. The purpose in prayer is to invoke the presence of God into the situation. It's to invite Him to participate with us. It, it invites the power of God to be manifest. It demonstrates our dependency upon Him. We can't do it without you. And what can you do without Him? Nothing. Nothing. And it accomplishes what we can never do ourselves. How did the disciples respond? They slept. They slept. Are we any different? I'm too tired to get up this morning to pray. Oh, I'm, it's getting too late at night for me to pray. In the middle of the day, I close my eyes. <laughs> and rather than praying, I go to sleep. You come up to a stoplight in a car, you close your eyes, and you, you better be praying, not sleeping. We sleep. We don't pray. We're just like the disciples. You've, you've heard me say so many times, no man is a total waste. He can always be used as a bad example. The disciples here are a bad example. Not a good example, a bad example. The problem is we follow their bad example. We go to sleep. We don't wait. We don't watch. We don't pray. You know what leaves us vulnerable to? The very thing Jesus was telling them about. Because he warns to wait, watch, and pray because of temptation. Temptation, the reason. Here we have the battle of Gethsemane. This intense battle that's going on. Jesus is spending the night in prayer, struggling with all the things that are going on. And he asked them to be an active participant. And you know why? So that they would not enter into temptation. Here he is in his last hours, and what is he concerned about? The disciples. You need to wait, watch, and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. Do you think Jesus was under temptation at this point? You think Satan was attacking? Do you think it was hard on Jesus? And what is he thinking? He's thinking of them. He'd already won the victory. Max Lucado in his writing, and the angels were silent, put it this way. The battle is won. You may have thought it won on Golgotha, 
It wasn't. You may have thought the sign of victory is the empty tomb. It isn't. The final battle was won in Gethsemane. And the sign of conquest is Jesus at peace in the olive trees. For it was in the garden that he made his decision. He would rather go to hell for you than to go to heaven without you. The point is, Jesus was concerned about the temptation the disciples would be entering. And he gave them safeguards about it. We battle against temptation. It's prevalent on every, every side. It was present with the disciples. On the night that this was occurring, Jesus understood what was going to happen the next day. When he was being tried and crucified and the devil would be whispering in the ears of the disciples, hey, where's this Christ you were talking about? Oh, you were trusting in this guy. This guy's so weak he's being killed. And then he hit them with guilt. <laughs> You deserted him. Hey, you slept when he said pray. Was temptation there for them? Yep. Yep. Jesus knew it was coming. Do we face temptation? Do we? What's the answer? Wait. Watch. Pray. Temptations are there. It's, they're all about us. Our marriages. Our future marriages. All of it are battles for our life. Our finances. We struggle. Our ministry and labor for Christ. Our fellowship with Christ. Our fellowship with one another. The struggles we have with prevailing sins and in personality flaws that we have, our relationships with one another, our love for God or lack of it, our love for one another or lack of it. It's all a struggle. It's a battle. And if we are not waiting, watching, and praying, it gets worse, not better. The battle is here. The battle is now, and we have to understand that. Chuck Swindoll, in his book, Moses, says, I believe there are many who have not responded to God's call on their lives, many who may have missed opportunities to flame brightly for him like a radiant city shining on a hill. I speak to so many who are waiting for some kind of curious sign in the heavens some engraved invitation hand-delivered by an angel, some wondrous mystical moment. And all God is waiting to hear, you say is, I'm here, Lord, I'm yours, thorns and all, just set me aflame. How is your life? How's your relationship with God? Spiritually, are you sleeping? Spiritually, are you comatose? Or spiritually, are you waiting on God, building anticipation? Are you watching Him and seeing what He's doing so that we too can live and act like Him? Are you praying? praying to guard against the temptations that hit us all. Wait. Watch. Pray.